Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another exciting episode of the Vinny Eastwood Show, broadcasting from New Zealand, the fabulous, the fluoridated, the somewhat irradiated, and the reason why I say somewhat is because we stopped testing for exactly how much, about, like, last year, including all the imports, which we apparently never checked in the first place anyway. <clears throat> My very special guest today is, you know, I was, sorry, I'm really, really sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm totally, totally disorganised and a terrible man and uh this means that sometimes i have to interview the same guest because they're just so freaking good in a short time frame so it is my regret and also my umpteen uh, uh, uh times pleasure to welcome back again thomas sheridan welcome to the show mate well thank you very much for that Vinny. i'm glad to to provide you with this uh this interview so soon after the, the recent one yeah well, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when you have a conversation with somebody, you think that the conversation's not finished, but you could definitely talk about other stuff. So um, let's get into it. So the uh, topic for today, or uh, at least for this segment, is uh, the free man movement. Now, uh, Thomas doesn't know a lot about it. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know uh, ridiculous amounts about it, although I have probably interviewed many, many people from the free man movement. Now, um First thing I want to like uh, put up there is that there's a whole bunch of different labels and, and a whole bunch of different methodologies that all kind of come from the same idea, and that's what I call the free man movement, uh, removing legal fiction names, uh, uh, becoming free from the system, not having your birth certificate owned by some other scumbag, not paying uh, unjust taxes, etc., that's that's more or less the 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 generalized mantra across all these different methodologies of uh, getting out of the system. Is that would, would you agree with that, Thomas? Yeah, I would. I think that's that's the way I perceive it as well. It's it's quite a broad church in many ways when you start looking at it that way, rather than one thing. And people seem to uh, come at it from different angles. But yeah, I, I'd agree with that. That's That would basically fit in my understanding of the free man movement. Okay. Now, my second understanding of the free movement, uh, free man movement, and, and this is in quotation marks, free man movement. I know you can call yourself uh, sovereign or uh, uh, just free or uh, some other term or, or whatever, but we're just speaking in a general kind of way and we want to just discuss the topic in, an, in and of itself, not implying that you know everybody who does this is stupid or, or, or anything of that nature. I'm just looking at it. Can you name me one person? who's done something like this in order to retain their sovereignty, become a free man, or get rid of their straw man, something like that, that one, didn't get arrested, harassed, or tortured by the authorities, two, still has their private property, house, car, boat, etc. Three, didn't lose their children or partner. Four, currently has a good life, good work, happy family. And five, has no post-traumatic stress disorder or mental and social problems. No. Okay, so... I can name people who've had... A person who's had an individual impressive victory in one aspect of, the, of it, but I cannot... Uh, it, it's actually a free woman. She's a friend of mine in Norway, and she managed to get from Norway to Portugal without a passport. So that's one person I know who actually had a success within one element of it. I don't know anyone else who's had. Well, what I would say is who's had. Now, okay, it's a it's a very difficult road for to go down. So it takes a lot of fortitude. It takes a hell of a lot of uh, heartbreak to get through it. It, 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 it is it my attitude is it's not worth doing it for that reason alone. And I think there are certain people who should not be doing it. And one of the things that people I think that should not be doing it are married men with children or married women with children. And I'll tell you why. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was staying in someone's house in England. And this guy was like an evangelical freeman. And he was sort of caught up in the the whole kind of the early messianic stage where you know everything is going to be wonderful you know this is the beginning of a new world and he was he was watching all the the videos by the truth by the free the top freeman he was doing the whole thing and 
he basically ended up subjecting his family to a life of uh, incredible disruption and insecurity uh, based on this, this, this desire he had to take on the system and win. His wife eventually left him with the kids and he's back. He's 48 years old and he's now back home living with his parents and he's on social welfare. He had a house. No, they, sorry, they were, they were renting a house from the from I think the local council. He had that. He had a nice wife, two lovely kids. Uh, he had a life. He had a family. And because he got into this Freeman thing, he basically lost. He, in order to prove a point, he lost the most important things in his life. And I thought it was a great tragedy. And that was exactly what put me off the Freeman thing for good. Like. The, the inherent danger of it, the inherent incredible hassle of it. I, I I don't know about you, but I try to avoid anxiety. I feel like I have uh, quite a large quantity of it just in my daily business. Um, so anything that actually causes to raise my level of anxiety, things like paperwork, interactions with authority figures, uh getting up early-ish in the morning to go to places where I, that are boring and don't want to be, that alone is the reason why I wouldn't, why I wouldn't do it. Now, yeah. here's the point, though. In 200 years' time, people that are going through this awful grief now may become known as the founding fathers of the new freedom that the world currently enjoys, Let, let's say theoretically, because... These people are doing what is right, what they feel is right, and technically, if you if you just want to like add up the numbers here, technically what they're doing is right. It's the right thing to do. However, they are often putting themselves at great risk and also destroying not only their own lives but the lives of their families in the process. Uh, so I, I think that's actually quite an interesting approach that you uh, you talked about there, Thomas. Is that you shouldn't do this if you've got uh, dependents or, or partnerships or something like that. I mean, even if they're on board with it as well, your life becomes an anxiety fest, okay? Because you've got to constantly be paranoid, constantly be reading up paperwork and doing all of this stuff. Um, and what occurs to me is that you go through a form of trauma-based mind control. Just like happens to uh, law students, you get sleep deprivation, silo mentality, which means you, you, you basically have to be one with the pack. And the other one is uh, complete fear of being wrong and uh, fear of judgment because like, that, that's how you got to – that's why you're motivated to dot all your I's, cross all your T's in order to get this little result, which takes you uh, – a long, long time, and you lose everything. Everything in your life that matters. That's how the system comes at you. Now, I don't see anybody who's up there on these uh, platforms encouraging people to go through uh, these processes in order to free themselves from the system. I don't see them uh, putting an open blanket warning saying to do this and to do it right will destroy your life, invariably, in some way, shape, or form. You might lose your money, you might lose your family, you might lose your sanity, or you might yeah. lose all three. Yeah. And that's one of the problems I have with it, that the leaders of this movement don't actually say that. They don't come out and do it. And I agree with you that once they're doing it for the right reasons, they're not trying to avoid you know, debts that they deliberately ran up in, in order, to, you know, in order to do this, or they, uh, you know, they're avoiding child support or something like that. Uh, they, yes, they are right. Morally, they're right because the legal system is, it, it, it is, is artificial. It's like anything else. Now, what you said about the trauma part of it is absolutely true. I mean, anyone who's ever been in a court you know, unless you're in there getting paid, it's a horrible experience. It's a horrible place to be. A courthouse... I, it, I don't it think is. getting paid or not makes a difference there, though. Yeah, but if you are getting a, a salary, 
like a decent salary as a lawyer or a judge, at least it helps you tolerate the misery of the building. Yeah, that's because you can buy the of the really. Experience. Yeah, it's because you can buy really expensive ways of helping you forget about it later on. It's precisely, that's why half of them are cokeheads and things like that. They're alcoholics. You now the expression is drunk as a judge. That's to try and clear out all the ne the, the negative energy they, they pick up all day in the courthouse. Now, if you go into that situation, you enter into that magic circle. When you go in there as a free man with your Black's Law Dictionary and, and the mountains of paperwork that you've spent all your time processing and writing up and studying each minutiae of, and you go in there, remember, you're going in there no matter what you will lose because everyone else in that courthouse is going to get paid except you. Now, that's, that's one way they've already beaten you. And secondly, everyone in that courthouse hates your guts. You have no friends in there. You are, you've literally entered into a, a pit of wolves and every one of them, every last one of them in there wants to savage you and they'll, they'll do everything to do it. Now we, we get these, these videos posted on, on YouTube where you'll show like free man victory or something like that. And a lot of them are very ambiguous and a lot of them come from the early days of when the movement was taken off 2008, 2009. And basically it was just saying, get this, Get this fucker out of my sight. I can't stand looking at him anymore. That's not a victory. A victory. That's almost like bamboozling the judge who were ignorant of it at an early stage and were trying to get rid of you. Since that time, a lot of the staff, a lot of the, the, the legal people, the lawyers, the judges, the police have become very, very knowledgeable of the free man movement. So that initial sort of first strike, early days, you know, successes, which are more out of frustration of the judge not now knowing how to handle it, are over. When, if you're trying that stuff now, you're going in there with almost no chance of survival. And it will, it, it'll, it'll be so soul-destroying. And there are some fellows who do enjoy that, but it can be so soul-destroying. You have to ask yourself, like you said, is it worth it? Is it, is it easier just to play the game? Like that's, that's how I feel about the system. My attitude is I keep my head down. I, I'm a model citizen and, I'm, and I've always have been in my own life just because I don't want, I don't need the hassle. Life is hard enough as it is without introducing more. And it seems to me there's almost a sadomasochistic quality to some of these free men guys. It's almost like they want they want that, that, as you says, that trauma-based mind control aspect of it. Well, the CIA did discover uh, a number of decades back that mind control programs that they were doing on people in MK Ultra, they found out that the victims actually got addicted to the programs and craved it. Yep. Mind control is addictive, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, and uh, if you're going through pain and suffering, that's used for mind control in the main because it's the most effective. How do you get the dog to stop biting your leg? You crack him on the frickin' head, don't you? And he stops biting your leg. <laughs> Unless it, you know, bites down harder or, or whatever. But, but you get the idea. It's simple pain response. It's a Pavlovian response, more or less. And people think that because you're not getting a physical electric shock or getting physically cracked over the head every time um, that you go in and get against the system, that it doesn't have an inherent trauma that gets picked up by your mind and actually affects your way of thinking. Um, however, there are many, uh, there are innumerable cases throughout history where individual men have literally taken one for the team and have laid down their lives and sacrificed everything in every way so that other people can be free. This is the context in which I, I, I view the free man people. Uh, and again, whatever label you want, let's not get uh, pedantic about it, although that's a kind of an ironic crowd to be asking to not be pedantic about the words that I'm using. <laughs> 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 but, you know, let's just keep our sense of humor about it. Now, I'm here to give those people coverage on this radio show any old time they please. And I have had many, many, many people, including leaders of the movement, on this radio show so that people can actually hear what these people go through. The reason why I do that isn't so all of you people out there will uh, know exactly what's going on. That's a secondary purpose. The primary purpose of it is to give somebody who's been through a lot of trauma a chance to 
release all of that uh, tension and pain and story of the stuff that they've been through so they can take a little bit of weight off their shoulders and put it onto me and I'll and I'll deal with it for them. I deal with trauma vicariously. I don't get directly traumatized. Instead, I'd simply try to interview and help people who are. Like the wounded healer sort of, sort of thing. That's the reason why I do it. And uh, it's also the reason why I can't actually uh, see myself going through this process myself of releasing me, myself from the legal fiction because then I won't be able to help any of the other people who are suffering out there, let alone the huge numerous amount of them that I'm going through right now. And uh, what happens is after you go through that process, I've known a couple of uh, uh, pretty learned guys who've had some uh, success in the courts, uh, Billy McKay from New Zealand, for example. And after you've gone through it yourself, you then try to help other people. Okay? But you can't really help anybody else. And nobody helps you when you're going through the process yourself. You're kind of all alone. Mm. It's just like I said, when you step into that magic circle, you're on your own. That's the end of it. And you, 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 it's so easy to make a mistake, and these bastards want to trip you up at every turn. That list you read out at the beginning, I think, is a very good list. I, I think that was a very healthy uh, thing you put out there today on the Internet. That list, I think that would be a very good list to put on your website or something that you have as page saying, before you consider going the free man route, ask yourself these questions. Because I'll tell you why. I think the, the free man movement has been in crisis, and I'm not naming names here, and I'm not putting any, any people down. I'm just mentioning a fact. I think it's been in serious crisis ever since a couple of the leaders of the movement, after you know years of telling us that you know it's all a fiction and you know you can beat the system, are giving you know giving press conferences from either inside jail cells or outside courthouses. This is this is not very reassuring to people. And yet there's still this kind of hope that people see this and they can't put one and one together. And this says if, if the absolute e expert, if one of the absolute experts on this is giving a press conference from a prison cell, then it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's as simple as that. In most ways, I feel that it's a uh, it's a public relations uh, and public perception war, and I believe that it might even be, ironically, more effective uh, just talking about these things and the legal fictions and and all of that kind of nature, uh, just to police. Like, don't be out there with a megaphone or anything. Just go up and talk to police ab about it and ask them uh, questions and see if they know. And uh, that's that's how you get public relations because uh, I'm thinking strategically here uh, in terms of going into a den of wolves the only way I could see that analogy working is if you are defended on all sides as you walk uh, yeah. or many of the wolves are no longer your enemies because yeah. you've spoken to them because they know you by reputation not because they've had to try and discipline you at the hands of the system and simply weren't able to beat you and a, and a really see you as a, a, a fly or a mosquito or a maggot that they wish to stay away from and not have to deal with, but instead they see you as a respectable member of the community and treat you as such. Well, that's how I engage with it. Uh, when I have to enter into the law dealing with a copper, going through an immigration check, anything like that, going to court, which I haven't been to in many, many years, I had a minor fine years ago. I am the most polite and agreeable and cordial and complicit person that they'll ever meet. I do not want a showdown. I do not want to express frustration. I want them to know that I am cooperating so I can be, they can be out of my face as soon as possible. So I don't have to deal with them anymore. And you brought up a very interesting point there. There's a certain element of free men that I've met, and they're not the majority, but I've met them. And they have a criminal nature in the sense that they're, they have a hard man 
they want to take on the law. They're, they're looking for some kind of showdown with the law or something like that. And this is, you know, like they're, 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 it's almost like they're looking for a confrontation. And these people are, you know, they're loose cannons within that movement, I would imagine. And you do see them. I've, I've actually went to a couple of Freeman meetings and there was literally a small percentage of the audience every time were criminals who were trying to, like, get out of a scam. As simple as that. They'd actually scam someone or, or something like that. And they just saw as this is one one extended stage of the criminality. It's funny you should mention that because in 2010, I was involved with a guy named uh, Shane Wenzel, who goes by the nomenclature Tane Rakau. He got uh, allegedly adopted into this tribe. He sold them this story about, you know, doing all this business and getting rid of the illegal fiction and doing their claim of rights and documents and everything. And um, he's been in jail for fraud a number of times. Not because, oh, he's doing the free man thing and they manufactured evidence, because he was a freaking fraudster. And he was doing yep. exactly what Thomas uh, uh, implied, using things that were meant to keep you free to keep him in the criminal business. And that's why people in the free man movement, free man movement have, have to distance themselves from fellas like that because they are there, because they, they go cha-ching, they see that, and they think it's a scam or a way to keep them out of jail or a way to get off charges. And they may have done some appalling things appalling things you know and this is what they do and that's one of the reasons it's uh it's not for me there is some a small element of shady individuals in it the rest of the people in it are are basically cutting into new territory brand new territory and they don't have a proper chart and th this whole thing i i got black's law dictionary which they carry that's not that's that that's not going to help you that's that's symbolism. That's just the, the trappings of, of this belief in the Freeman thing. But they're traveling into uncharted waters. And they're going, like you said, they're all going to be savaged. Every last one of them. None of them are going to get away with it. There will be no happy endings for any of them. And along the way will be a mountain of misery. And I know people are going to be listening to this now and saying, oh, Sheridan's a shill again. Oh, he's, he's trying to put us all off our freedom. No, I'm just trying to tell you that life is short and life is stressful enough. And the best way to live your life is to keep as much shit off your back as possible. And when you enter into this Freeman thing, you're going to get so much shit piled on you as well as the stuff you're going to have to deal with in your life where people you know die or you have problems or you get a divorce or some all these kinds of things and w along with the regular life troubles on top of that do you really want to add a whole new you know a whole new burden of sorrow and that's 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 my attitude to it now, I think that's one uh, a very valid attitude, and I think the other very valid attitude is freedom isn't actually free. Okay? You get what you pay for. If you want your freedom, if you really, really, really want it, it will cost you everything in a lot, in a lot of ways. Don't go into it with the illusion of thinking it's going to be easy or thinking that you're going to have good night's sleeps, or thinking your relationships with your family, friends, support network, your banker, everything will change. It'll be destroyed and have to be rebuilt anew. Okay? Yeah. And that, and that in itself is the, uh, the essence, I think, that, that is missing from people uh, and their comprehension of any of these uh, different factions of the movement is that you must expect that it will destroy you and so that you can rebuild yourself free and not the other way round. You're listening to the Vinnie Easter Show. My very special guest at the moment is uh, Thomas Sheridan. ThomasSheridanArts.com is his website. He's an author of a number of books about uh, psychopathy and, and that kind of thing. And uh, also go to TheVinnieEastwoodShow.com. That's Vinnie with a Y because it's the most important question. Eastwood as in go ahead, make my news. And go ahead, make a donation. We'll start up with a subscription today to uh, send us a regular donation of around about $5 a month. And uh, that just basically keeps everything running as usual. We keep pumping out the information, paying the rent, paying the power, paying the internet. Living's expensive. 
and it's very, very stressful. Thank goodness I don't also have to pay court costs at the same time. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. And it's with uh, Thomas Sheridan today. ThomasSheridanArts.com is the website if you want to understand psychopathy, which is basically the, um, the, 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 the nougaty nugget of goodness straight in the centre and directly involved with almost all cases of scumbaggery. Then get some of his books, like Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath. Thomas, welcome back. Thank you, Benny. Okay, now, uh, we had a, a couple of items on the agenda for today uh, about uh, about psychopathy and, and whatnot. You wanted to talk about the, the gin, was it? Yeah, this has been like a thing that's been interesting me for a while now. The idea of, uh, ever since I read Paul uh, Levy's book with Tico, and I looked at that, and I said, "Okay, that makes that's starting to make sense to me." And I said, "Okay, I've looked at the I've looked at the psychopathic thing from you know every angle except a proper deep look from the spiritual angle." At the end of puzzling people, I had an addendum, addendum in the or in the appendix where I spoke about a family in the United Arab Emirates who are incredibly wealthy, yet like one third of the children of the country are dying of starvation. So you have this enormously wealthy country where you have this elite royal family who are basically keeping all the money for themselves, not looking after their own people. And this family boasts about being direct descendants of having interbred with the jinn. So that always stuck with me, that idea of the jinn, the, the whole idea of this Islamic entity, race, that don't actually exist in this reality, born of smokeless fire, which would suggest something to do with plasma or something like that. And they, they're capable of observing this reality, quite disturbing when you actually think about that. But we can't see theirs because they exist outside it. And it's a, it's when you look at the jinn thing, I was look. I've, I've been reading again for the second time the, the Vengeful Gin by Rosemary Ellen Guiley. I believe you had already a show there once, and uh, th- it's really hitting things for me. It's making me understand, especially when I compare it to folk like Gaelic or Celtic folklore. People, because of Disney, people think that fairies are lovable, adorable creatures they're not our celtic ancestors lived in perpetual terror of the fairies in the same way that the islamic people the arabic middle eastern persian people fear gay people terror sorry fear gay people the fairies no <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> fear feared fear the jinn and the same it's the same story this that they 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 have they're they're a race that don't exist in this reality but crave it they want to be here they believe this planet belongs to them and human beings are a an almost like an infection or a pestilence upon the planet which has to be moved out now coupling with that with the idea of Watiko by Paul Levy you have the idea of the consciousness parasite which is what I call it that if these psychopaths in power are somehow infected, that's the term I used, by this gin, archontic, demonic, watiko, what virus, whatever you want to call it, it explains their behavior because the behavior of the global elites is very similar to how folklore talks about how fairies and the gin view the human race. They see us as a disease on this planet. We have to be culled. We have to be removed. So they alone, in our case, in this reality, the, the global elite, can live like gods among pure nature. This is how they think. This is also common to the folklore surrounding these non-human entities, regardless of where they are, from the, the Nagas of India all the way up to the the various you know entities and fairy folks of the Nordic, Scandinavian, and Celtic world, and then we have it again repeated in the the Islamic world with the jinn. I have really come to see that 
with the psychopath thing, we're dealing fundamentally with a spiritual, a spiritual problem, an infection of the consciousness, a parasite that actually gets into human consciousness, generally at the moment of birth, and produces the psychopathic individual. However, normal, healthy individuals can find themselves in the domain, shall we say, of the the primary infectors, the pure psychopaths, who carry this consciousness parasite inside them. And whether they are in a political party or a boardroom of a corporation, in a the war room of a military operation, a police department, a cult, whatever, a, a b- bunch of nuns in an Irish nunnery that are starting to neglect children and let them die until there's like something like a 60% mortality rate. The infection can spread to decent people and they too can become infected by this consciousness because it's not that they, they get a, they get a jinn or a demon or a fair, you know a, a beast of their own in their own heads, but the the primary infector at the at the head of the cult at the head of the coven at the head of the the boardroom infects the other ones around them with the same the same specific entity, and this is why it's very important as I've been saying from day one when you know someone is a psychopath. We spoke about this last time. You get the hell away and you have no contact ever again. You don't fight with them. You don't challenge them. You don't become aggressive to them. You don't respond to their smear campaigns because the, they want the smear campaign is put out there in order to, to infect you. Because what will happen is you, if they want, they will try and get you to have the smear campaign at the same level done as personally and as viciously from your side. And what happens then is that allows infection of you if you do this. That's why when you have a smear campaign aimed at you, you don't respond because eventually these things burn out. And this is how the infection can spread. This is why we have to be very, very careful when we deal with these kind of these 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 high level, high functioning psychopaths and how they operate, especially at a time of emotional and personal crisis, because that's what lets them in. That's how they get into us, and that's how they feed upon us. This is the reason why people join cults. This is the reason why people do stupid things like take like really bad heavy drugs that can also cause infection and i now um, am incidentally uh, th- there's two types of drugs that make you uh, a lot more susceptible to infection one is uh, speed you know amphetamines and uh, yep. the other being alcohol and cocaine cocaine's a bad one too but yeah alcohol particularly heavy alcohol that's you know why do you think they call it spirits you know, when did they call it gin and tonic? You know, you just think about those things. You know, these are synchronistic, synchromistic terms that have actually come to actually portray what's really going on. You have to be very, very careful with alcohol, especially hard alcohol, anything that's like, you know, like things like moonshine or things like a hell of a lot of whiskey drinking that can really bring it, bring, can really bring it on. But it's important that people learn to have a sense of spiritual hygiene. This is this is a this is a big one now. You have hygiene in your personal life, you don't want to get infections, you don't want to get diseases. You have a cut, you take care of it. Well we have to be like this now with our consciousness. We have this is see well this kind of brings us a little bit back to the to the free man thing. Because the free men when they enter into the black magic circle of the courtroom, ultimately the reason why they and you just said they become addicted to the trauma, like the CIA found now. What's happening is they're becoming infected, and they're becoming infected, and they, they, this pathological feedback loop develops inside them that's slowly eating their souls away, dissipating their consciousness to the point where they're not actually functioning correctly. They're not their their cognition on the sort that not their subconscious is goes go completely down. It's the same thing that happens to cult members. Yeah. 
Oh, exact same thing. Well, well, fact, like you have so many families and things like that. They 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 find their their daughter after a while after she's been part of a cult and she's just not the same person. All the things that made her her had been had withered away. She's gone. She's actually he or she who's joined the cult has been fed has been sorry has fed the psychopathic cult leader the the entity inside the the main the main sort of queen bee or king bee at the center of the cult. The psychopathic cult leader has sucked the souls of the cult member away. There's no recovery. There's no recovery. The only people that can seem to have that, that can recover from cults are ones who are raised there as children when their parents went into the cult, because somehow for some reason, because they didn't have a previous life before the cult, they know nothing better. So they're not really. They're not really as infected as the parents are because the parents had a previous life. This is why I always say to people, if you go into a cult and you don't get out at an early stage, you're gone. I'm sorry, you're gone. It's gone. It's been, you've been taken. And I don't know what happens to your soul. I don't know what happens to your personality. But you're not in there anymore. You're just a shell. And you're right. From anything, all these cults, their families always say the same thing. It's not the same person anymore. Now, I was having a discussion uh, with a woman last night about this exact uh, topic. And a lot of the things that you've actually uh, brought up in in your explanations are are almost word for word, Thomas, what I told her. Um, because we're, we're talking about this uh, dude Tane Rakao like uh, sort of thing. He's back, and he's and he's like, oh, I'm business coach and, and things of that nature, using the free man biz as a, as a total freaking cult leading psychopath. I saw big uh, uh, collections of L. Ron Hobbard materials. He's probably using the techniques of Scientology, mind control, and and uh, and all of that kind of jazz. Like literally a freaking cult. The guys, the guys, really scary. And um, when she first talked to him, all these red flags come up because she used to work for. Uh, uh, the child, youth, and family services—you know the, um, the what the the the, the kid, child kidnapping sort of government rings that they have all around the world, sort of thing—used mm. to be in that, and uh, is now part of a different organisation entirely uh, funded by a charity instead of uh, having government control where they actually help people instead of play the part in a pedophile ring. So she knows what the difference is between somebody who's telling you a whole bunch of stuff because they actually want to help you, and somebody who's telling you a whole bunch of stuff because they want to deceive you and. Take take your kids from you <laughs> you know and, and and that's that's kind of the only reason why she was able to identify him really quickly and come to me and ask and ask me about him and um uh what what was really uh, interesting about about this topic is i tried to actually uh explain uh something about the the different part of uh psychopaths i said you forget if you're a psychopath without remorse and won't think twice about lying or so- selling someone else out to save your ass the system the justice system goes easy on you if you're honest have integrity and honor they will crucify you it's sad but ultimately not worth it and doesn't work anyway going after them uh, psychos have a kind of a psychic warning system that warns them when danger is near making them incredibly hard to kill and um it's like the whole system works that way and then a thought occurred to me you know have you ever heard of the phrase by the people for the people replace the word people with psychotic criminal scum and that's the system we live in isn't it yeah yep it's not for us we we are the fact we are the chickens in on, on Colonel Sanders' battery chicken farm. That's what we are. Get that into your head. That's what that that that's our level of power in this system. There will be no glorious uprising. There will be no moment of salvation. There that will not happen. We were talking earlier about the free man. Let's look at the other aspect of that: the money system. I'm always getting. I'm always getting contacted by people who say Thomas I have a new idea for a new monetary system or a new mathematically perfected economy I have this idea where we can do away with money or we have our own money and blah 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 and they all mean well and they've all worked hard on it and as someone I heard say the other night you should take these people up in a helicopter and fly them over the city of London or fly them over Wall Street fly them over Frankfurt or fly them over Hong Kong the financial districts of those cities and just show them 
the size and the magnitude of the beast. And they think that their idea is going to topple that or going to replace that. They become delusional. They forget just how big the monster is. It's enormous. It's beyond their comprehension. And this is what happens because we're raised, as you said, by the people, for the people. We're raised in the belief that we have rights. And, you know, we're, we're raised with all these folk stories from Ned Kelly to, you know, to Paul, Paul Revere to Robin Hood to all these kind of archetypal folk heroes who took on this, the, 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 the sheriff or the, the local judge or the, the you know, the, even the government and won. They don't exist. They never existed. That's a lie they give us. That's a lie. The monster is enormous. There is no David and Goliath story here. It's not going to happen. And if people could actually see this at an early point in this development, they wouldn't waste all this emotional and psychic energy on the impossible. I have the same kind of feeling about the chemtrails thing. I don't know what the chemtrails thing is. I believe that there's some kind of spraying going on. When I say spraying, I don't necessarily mean spraying. There's something going on with aircraft trails. But having started to study it myself from a completely different angle, I actually think it's something far more sinister and far more terrifying than simply jets with chemical fuel in their, in their, in their engines or in their wings and they're spraying it out. I think it's something far more, far more massive. And it's the same kind of analogy of taking the person who has the, the new money system and flying them over to the city of London. It's the same kind of idea. They're not even close to comprehending what's going on. Because I've seen things with that whole chemtrail thing that has actually had me questioning reality. I saw things happen before my eyes. I've now come to the conclusion that it's, so, it's not geoengineering. It's something much more in, sinister and much more terrifying and it's not even involving the aircraft it's involving the atmosphere and it's taking place on the ground infecting the affecting the atmosphere and they're doing something to this planet they're changing it they're tuning this planet into a different channel or diff they're, they're, they're tuning into a different frequency i can tell this now i saw two weeks ago standing on a beach here with a friend of mine a black tube about 40 miles long appear in the sky out of nowhere now it wasn't a reflection of another chemtrail on a cloud or on a milky sky this is in a clear blue sky this thing this black tube appeared in the sky and then into it flew another plane with a classic chemtrail thing that thing was not generated by an aircraft and we've been taking pictures and looking at these aircraft and a lot of them are not planes they look more like rockets or something like that. I don't even think they're there. I think a lot of them are projections. And I think I think what ultimately what they're doing, my theory is that they're turning the actual sky above the earth. They're tuning it in like a giant television station. And they're probably using you, uh, some kind of... Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, finish. They're probably using some kind of electromagnetic directed energy to do that. I'm, 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 I'm not saying it is what's happening, but I think that's to me. And they have everyone thinking about spraying and chemicals and all this kind of thing. So we, it's just like so many other things in, in, in the, in the alternative movement. Memes and cultures develop that take our eyes off what's real, what may be really going on. Yeah. And because here's that's how, how you psychopaths know, are. Yeah. Well, here's how you know that you don't really know what you're talking about. Do you get emotional? Right? If you're totally calm, totally chilled out, you, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, you've got your emotions in check. And when somebody's arguing with you and presenting facts, figures, and things of that nature, if you don't have anything to counteract those facts and figures, and you say, well, well, no, actually, we had this study there and blah, 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 blah. And provided they're sitting there listening to you and going, oh, yeah, okay, well, I didn't know that. Thank you very much. And they're, and they're agreeing, and, and, and you're actually having a proper back-and-forth conversation based on facts without any emotional investment in the topic whatsoever. That's when you know that you really got a topic down and you're actually quite prepared to learn it and uh, evaluate your thinking. When you get emotional, on the other hand... 
when you start getting really angry, when you start getting hot under the collar, once your heart starts beating a little a little fast and you fold your arms and you start and you start to grit your teeth and things of that nature, that's when somebody's telling you something that is making you feel uncomfortable. The reason why it's making you feel uncomfortable is because you're basing a lot of your life work plans, etc upon that belief which is currently being destroyed and shattered before your eyes with one person foolishly stumbling into your life and giving you a few contradictory facts that make your entire life's work for naught. That's why that emotional response happens. Okay? Now, that's what, ha- that's what happens when, you, when you're actually a good, decent person. Psychopath doesn't have that kind of problem, though. All right? And uh, I was thinking about... Um, uh, how complicated the, the topic is because when you think about this there's a number of different phases to it and I did a, uh, a week a, one of my um, um, I guess associate producers uh, set up a week of uh, topics and uh, discussions with three different areas of the study of psychopathy uh, one was uh, the brain, the behaviours and uh, just general stuff that, that uh, mainstream public little Joe public can do we did that with um uh, yourself, Thomas, and uh, Jay Widener and uh, James yep. Corbett. And uh, the second one was about the history, about uh, 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 back in the day, how this all, how this all came about, uh, archons, etc. And uh, the three became the uh, the myths and legend, getting into the the gin topic. And it was pretty scary to see what was out there. Um, and, and what all three disciplines recommended the exact same approach as you mentioned earlier, uh, Thomas, uh, cut off all contact, even if it's your mother, child, or oldest friends, there's nothing you can do. And, uh, all, all three of those disciplines also concluded another interesting fact that it's capable of turning others into psychopaths through prolonged contact, often coupled with abuse of some kind. Hence the reason to cut off frickin' contact. Yep. And we're in an abusive relationship with our uh, our leaders, whatever they are, the scumbags in charge. We're in an abusive relationship with them. And focusing on that abusive relationship in the wrong way is dangerous to yourself because you've been played into a trap, but you're also leading yourself possibly towards frustration. People always say to me, what's a psychopath? I always say, I don't know. I have an idea, but I don't know for sure because I could be wrong. So I'm not going to put all my emotional eggs in that one basket and that brings us back to things like chemtrails again don't be putting all or anything like the theory behind 9 11 don't be putting all your eggs in just one basket because that basket maybe have been created for you to do that in order to divert you from something else because when you understand how the psychopath mind works they will play on your emotions they will play on your emotional responses to things so, for instance, people people look up and they see all these, these 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 aircraft trails. The psychopaths don't want them to know about it. So, what they do is they make something up, like, well, they're being they they they, they create the liberty conspir the liberal conspiracy, say, saying we're gassing the people, we're killing them. Could be true. I don't know personally. I just don't know. I just haven't seen enough. I've seen much more proof that there's something really bizarre going on with electromagnetics than I ever had than I do with chemical spraying, because I just don't see the logistics behind that there but anyway the the people sorry sorry thomas passion. sorry to interrupt but there was something i did want to mention charlie sheen's movie uh the arrival how they changed the climate so so that the aliens could live here more comfortably yeah there's lots of things like that uh i think if i was to throw a guess at this they're they're turning the sky and they're tuning it if you look at so many of these if you look, it's they're more than just chemtrails now. The more than just trails now. If you start to look at it, you're starting to see bizarre grid patterns appearing in the sky. It's changed. It's not the same as it was like a couple a year or two ago. There's been a in the last few months. There's been a huge change with these trails. They don't look the same anymore. They're literally teased out more. They tease out faster, and there's all kinds of interesting grid patterns and colors appearing in them now. This is what I believe. Possibly, I'm speculating now. My hypothesis is that they're trying to experiment with the sky to use it for projecting images on. This could be anything from something tacky as putting McDonald's logos in the sky, which is, you know, which isn't, wouldn't be far fetched the kind of way they, they think, to maybe even staging terrorists and wars or a fake alien. I don't know. Anything, 
anything. But I do believe they're actually using the sky like a cathode ray tube, and they're they're, they're actually tuning it in. When you see these planes, this is, this explains the grid pattern. The grid pattern is of these trails in the sky are created in such a way that they cross. Now, when they cross and they start to dissipate, they create this big milky screen, this gray, silvery, milky screen in the sky. That silvery screen is identical to the inside coating of an old-fashioned television set, set, sorry, cathode ray tube that the electrons will be fired at. Also, the fact that they're, they're, they're sprayed in two different directions. I know we're going way off topic here. You, you have you have a positive and a negative charge. So you could have one set of planes flying north south, north to south, say north to south, with a positive charge, and the other flying east west with a negative charge. You then have a charged atmosphere of these of these clouds, and then you have the the ability then to manipulate or direct electrons fired from Earth on it in order to create projections in the sky. It, it's not that far fetched. It's it's. To me, it's fairly plausible, and after what I saw two weeks ago, I have no doubt that what they're doing in the sky is incredibly weird. It's incredibly strange, and I don't think even the wildest conspiracy theory has even has even touched the tip of the iceberg on it. We'll be, we'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, at the